get assigned where they belong. And at this point, our dining room is now moved up to the great quality. Our uh, hospital dormitory is still only a fine quarters, however. Certain other buildings also count as potential rooms. You'll see them marked as like tables or chairs by themselves. And there's our record keeper and her kid helping us keep records right here. I don't think we have an engraver yet, but we've got a lot of idlers, so let's take a look and see who's really idle in our fortress and needs jobs to do. Looks like we've probably got a few too many Fletchers for right now, so let's go ahead and make this one into an engraver. I don't have anybody else really who's skilled in engraving our stoneworker here as a level 1, but that's not really that big a deal. So we'll go ahead and get the engraver working. Now, engravers, you want to make sure that only your skilled engravers are actually doing engraving, and your unskilled engravers are doing all your smoothing. Smoothing counts as engraving experience, but doesn't have a quality, whereas once they start carving on your walls permanently, well, then you care about how skilled they were. So you want to make sure you have them smooth pretty much everything in your fortress and then go back and do your engravings on top of it. Engraving adds nice pretty pictures and if it's high quality engravings your dwarves can stare at them and get happy about it. So engraving your dining room, engraving your dormitory if you have one, engraving the hallways that lead to your bedrooms and so forth are all great ways to give your dwarves something nice to stare at to make them happy. If you focus on those, if you focus those high skill engravers on terrain that your dwarves are going to see regularly, you can maximize the effects. Summer is upon us. Now, when we've got DF hack, I'll actually pretty much skip the manager and move right into workflow. I'll appoint the manager as a profile and as a fig leaf for the fact that workflow is helping me micromanage my repeat jobs. But basically, workflow is doing nothing for me except taking my taking away some of the requirement that I focus obsessively on what's happening at every job, at every workstation, and all the way through my fortress. So, someone was asking earlier, Aegis, I think it was you, and bear with me if I'm wrong, no sweat, The um, about the depth of water versus mud. So here, this, this is where my well will be built, and the first floor has open space and water, and there's water all the way down to the bottom, and then only the bottom floor has a dusting of mud. Whereas if you look at the staircases around it, those all have piles of mud living on them already. And what you're basically seeing here is those would be bad areas to draw water from, but the center water is clear and open and drops all the way down. So they'll draw water from this first floor where it's clean. You'll keep the mud out of your water. I do need to designate a zone for that, though, because it's not designated as a water source. I want my folks only using the water from my well if they need to do something with water. I want them coming here. Um... We will smooth, pretty up, and engrave this room. Dwarves will come here to wash themselves off with soap, which we need to make here momentarily. Um, we'll want them to come here and do it, rather than going out to a murky pond out on the surface, because that's where the water is. So now we need to make sure that we set, if we didn't in our first episode, one of those activity zone orders. We want zone only drinking and that will make sure that if they have to drink water they come to this area as well. So this will this will get them coming here to do their cleaning which is what we want. Now I do need to build a well and let's say I'm going to build the well here. Let's see what we've got. For blocks we don't have much. Ideally I want my well made of high quality ingredients so gold would be perfect if we had gold. But we don't seem to have any gold so Another good quality would be something like iron or silver, something that's got a little more value to it. 
if we were lucky enough to get obsidian, obsidian is a value of three, that wouldn't be too bad. Glass blocks and flux would be a value of two. Plain value blocks would be a value of one. So your your multiplier here is blocks are worth five times the base value. So this is five for all these blocks. They're base stone. We don't have anything fancy for our well. That's kind of bad, but let's say for a moment we were going to use bauxite just because. Buckets, we have the same problem. We've got a bunch of low quality buckets that aren't really worth much money. I'd want to make a bucket out of gold because gold is valuable. So let's get our metalsmiths doing something useful beyond metal working for our military, which we didn't reset up once we changed. So I'm going to do that as well. Awesome. So let's talk about making some iron items to replace those ones that A, either we don't have, or B, don't have the right quality on. Reeves and high boot and gauntlet and helm. Oops. Helm. Put those on repeat. Make sure that's everything. Make sure Helm, yeah, that's good. Okay, now I need to add uh, to the other one. We'll do ten jobs with weapons, iron, spears, and then we'll do iron warhammers, iron battle axes, and that'll give us some base level quality for our military. Ideally, we want them in steel, so this is merely a stopgap to get them armored and equipped. Not really where we want to go. Now, if your fortress doesn't have weaponable metals, let's say you've settled on a glacier because you wanted a challenge, you dig down into the world and you find out there's no iron, there's no copper, no silver, you've got gold, let's say. At that point, your options are fairly limited. You're down to, um, oh, well, if I have no coal, I know what to do for that. Hang on a second. If you're down to, uh, non-weaponable metals, you're looking at trade and goblinite. And by goblinite, I mean the goblins come, they have iron equipment, they have copper equipment, they have, you know, steel is not available to anything other than dwarves, so you won't have any steel. But they have iron and bronze and copper and silver, and you can kill them and take it when they come to your fortress. At which point you can basically harvest them with either traps or uh, a strong military, once you've got one, who can basically beat them down and take their stuff. Yeah, I don't think you can actually make arrows out of... I'd have to look. Maybe you can make them out of gold, but I wouldn't try. I wouldn't really do it. Now, our smelters are canceling jobs, and our forges are canceling jobs because there's no fuel. Well, the reason there's no fuel is because I didn't sell these guys to start making charcoal. So we need to get them making our charcoal up. And we need to get this guy back on beds, bins, and barrels, because those are his primary items. I also want to make some lye, because I'm going to need that for soap, so we're going to see if we can't make a few stacks of lye for ourselves to make some soap out of. And I think we're doing good on the crossbows, so that's good. Now, if the invasions will hold off another season or two, we'll start to have enough dwarves that we can really do some labor. While I could min-max these current 14 a little more, and I certainly can if I've got things I need to do. Mine workers can get started on our bedrooms. Uh, ceramics, I don't have magma yet, and I want to save my current levels of fuel for metalworking because it's more important at this juncture. So those guys can be made into haulers, temporarily at least. My fletchers need to get working on cloth and bone carving. So let's go get that done if we haven't already. Let's double check. Looks like we've got somebody doing the carvings. So let's go downstairs to the cloth and make sure that we loom up some all of our dyed thread. And weave up any cloth thread we've got laying around. Plant cloth. And then we'll make some cloth items. Now, dwarves require... Feet, legs, chest. That's the rule. Feet, legs, chest. Feet, you can do shoes or socks. Legs, you can do trousers or uh, 
cover them with some kind of armor. Greaves, for example. Chest, you're down to dress and uh, robe and shirt and vest. So typically what I'll do is I'll actually make more items than I really need out of cloth. I'll make shoes for my dwarves' feet, caps for their heads, gloves for their hands. Gloves aren't essential for keeping your dwarves clothed. They don't match the feet, legs, chest is the minimum required. And having optional items doesn't help. So trousers, and then I usually make my dwarves wear robes for their main equipment. So now we're going to make those items just non-stop as long as we have cloth, if any. We may not have the cloth right now, so they'll cancel the job if that's the case. So we don't have any we don't have any collected plant thread, but we do have some cloth because our guy got busy making cloth items. So he'll make some for, he'll make some basic clothing for us. Not much, just a little. And one of my viewers comments, clubs are great for keeping poison off your hands, which does come in handy if your dwarves are cleaning, I grant you. The cleaning labor is pretty hard to get them to do, though. Aquifers are one of those things that I take it or leave it. If you're going to play with aquifers, I highly recommend playing in an area that, that allows you to bypass the aquifer. For example, if you had a swamp with an aquifer adjacent to a desert that didn't, I would tell you to put your fortress in the desert area and only do the things in the aquifer area that you needed to do with respect to the aquifer. Realistically, I think they're not really something a new player needs to concern themselves with. It's one of those things that I would turn on later. I do like to put my military or put my civilians in the military for crossbow use. Absolutely. Keep in mind, your bolt consumption when you do that goes through the absolutely goes through the roof if you have any archery targets on site. So you either have to shut them down or minimize where your civilians are allowed to train in order to keep your consumption reasonable. Because you can deforest the surface if you've got 200 dwarves all training in their off hours as crossbowmen. You might be able to bypass that, at least in part, by uh, using the bolt separation and melting exploit, if that hasn't been fixed yet. But realistically, you're going to be doing bolts of bone and wood. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about serious puppy mills and turkey mills in order to get that done. You're really going to have to crank out the butchery, that's all there is to it. And you're probably going to have to deforest the surface on top of it. And we need to do some leather working too, now that I'm thinking about it, because we never added, we never made quivers for our... Uh, and I want quivers, several of them, and then I'm going to go over to the other workshop, and I'll put some orders for cloaks in once I know I have some quivers done. Any leather we confiscated from the caravan will be brought down here. Now our ashery reminds me we need ash in addition to our charcoal in order to supply our ash industry, our lye making industry. So we're going to make a few units of ash here out of each one of these. And then I'm going to make some ash out of this one as well. We don't need a whole lot. I'm not going to make fertilizer, so I don't need a great ton of it. But we'll get a couple of our haulers basically tied up doing ash making, and then once we've got that, we'll make the lye. And then since we've got the butchering done, I think we've probably got tallow. Let's check our kitchen stocks. Kitchen stocks say tallow. If not, I can butcher a couple of animals and get fat and use the fat to make tallow. Don't see tallow in the list, so it doesn't look like we've either used. It doesn't look like we've got it or we've used it. I don't think we've been cooking anything, so we haven't used it. In fact, our kitchens are not being very used at the moment. Let's get somebody into the cooking industry, shall we? Let's start cooking. Let 
Looks like we've got one hauler who's actually pretty good at cooking already, but by the standards of everybody else. We'll make them into a kitchen worker. To make my sandwich. And... Yeah, I'll actually leave tanning on for that first, and if they're not cooking, they can be tanning. We won't need... We won't need as many tanners as we'll have, so that won't be fine. And that'll get us meal production ready. As well as rendering our fat into tallow. Yep, I don't turn off auto butch auto kitchen. That's that those automation features. It, truthfully, the reason I like workflow as much as anything else, as much as it gives me the control, isn't really the control, because you can do that yourself, manually in vanilla dwarf fortress. It's just a pain in the rear. So all the automation features that I can grab, especially things like I want to automatically render my fat into tallow, I'm down for that. That's great. I leave those off. The only one I really don't do is auto-collecting webs, and that's because depending on how you've got it set up, auto-collecting webs can be dangerous. I typically pick a tallow I will have a lot of and turn it off and then cook everything else. So turkeys, we're going to breed turkeys, and turkeys just produce like you would not believe. They're astoundingly productive in terms of fat, meat, and leather. Eggs. My god. You can feed a fortress on turkeys without a problem if you bring enough of them. So we'll actually render all of our turkey tallow down for soaps. So all of our soaps can be made out of our turkeys. The other types of random fat we accumulate, I cook it all off. I, I don't I don't care if they cook that stuff. I just want to make sure I have at least one tallow for soap. And truthfully, we won't use as much turkey tallow, anywhere near as much turkey tallow as we will produce. So at some point, I'll, you know, make enough soap to last us for a while, cook down some of the excess. So now we've probably got some ash built up. Let's go ahead and get those lie jobs started again, and we'll make three or so out of each one. And they'll need barrels and buckets and all that good stuff to make their lie, but then we'll have lie, which we can make into soap. We need lie and tallow. And as you can see, we've started to pretty well go through our wood. This is one of those reasons why I started stockpiling it in the first place. Let's turn wood hauling on everybody who doesn't have a job. Temporarily. At this point, I really don't care. I need, I need all these people who are idle to be doing something useful, and wood collecting would be a useful thing right now. So they'll go running outside the fortress and grab as much wood as they can carry and bring it back stash it in this upper stockpile. And they'll also take the wood from the upper stockpile and move it downstairs to the uh, workshop area where we're using the wood up. So this will help save our, our carpenter from making long trips. It'll start making his trips shorter because he'll have the wood brought to him. I don't know, have they actually buried him yet? Yeah, they finally got around to it. Somebody eventually got over their horror enough to actually put the corpse where it belonged. So, all his parts, but by then he'd long since gone rotten. So, you know, there was a happiness hit there when, when he went rotten. I don't think there's much for it. I think the only thing you can realistically do is... And that may be what you have to do. We may have to designate a, a an undertaker, basically. Um, who's the only one in the fortress that has the burial duty assigned by default. And have him bury all the corpses. Or have two, of, two or three people who are just burial detail. Specifically because they build up a uh, resistance to it if they see enough corpses, I'm sure. 
from society. Secretive is good, and that's a mad doc, so he didn't have any other skills anyway. That's even better. Let's see what workshop he goes and claims, if any. Ooh, a metalsmith's forge. That's nice. So we're going to get something made out of metal here. And he didn't start work, so he's needing something. What's he need here? Square blocks, cut gems. We don't have any cut gems. Metal bars, which we probably have or should have. We need to check on the metal. Blocks, gems. Okay, so let's see what he's collected. So far, he's collected the metal bars and the blocks, which means he needs the cut gems. And that makes sense because we don't yet have a jeweler's workshop. So let's temporarily build a jeweler's workshop here because we don't have um, a whole lot of space to spread out here. I don't want to make our fortress too wide. I want to make it tall and skinny, not broaden it out. So we may put our jeweler's workshops right adjacent to the things that they're going to be encrusting, i.e. the uh, mugs. We'll put two jeweler's workshops in. One to cut, one to encrust. Let's just double it up and do two to encrust and two to... That's fine. I don't care what the workshop's made out of. I just want to get them up. There we go. And that should work well. Now, we need to make sure somebody's got the labor... Come and pick these up. Oh, doesn't look like it. So let's go look and see if our ceramics workers, if we can get them to stop hauling wood for a second and do this thing we need them to do. No burial, no wood hauling. Just the jewel stuff, please. Let's see what we get. Yeah, see, I figure that's what you're going to have to do. We're basically going to have to appoint... I mean, this works right now, but when it comes time to bury... Uh, when it comes time to bury uh, the, remnants of your, the remnants of your army after a failed repel, siege repel, and you have to send out your civilians en masse to pick up the number of corpses and items you're going to have, that's going to take a lot of time to clean up even the smallest siege until they get them over the corpse thing. That's a lot of labor time, basically, that'll get chewed up. We'll see. That ought to be interesting. I'm paving this area in order to keep it from growing over with trees or and to make sure there's no uh, other things that might impact. Is that what we, dug? we do? Oh, we started to probably dig down and I decided I didn't want to do it right at the edge of the map right there. I want to dig it away further. Okay, that's what I did. We'll have our road kind of zig right here.
And that'll get us a good start on having a road. As long as you don't forget about it, you're in good shape. Only way your dwarves starve to death is if you forget they gotta eat, or you don't know. And if you go very quickly into farming, like we did in a soil layer, just, you know, dig it out, plant it, you'll have food to live, to keep your dwarves alive pretty much from the first season, if you've got any kind of grower with you at all. Um, bring plump helmet seeds, that's all you need. You can get by with it. Your If you pierce the caverns, you'll grow the other kinds. Plump helmets will suffice until you get by. You only need the variety if you want to be able to plant them all right from the start. And roads made of rock salt do not behave according to the laws of normal rock salt. Treat it as a uh, non-soluble kind. These are like giant blocks of rock salt, <laughs> cased in lucite. And we've started to get ahead of our wood consumption now. We're starting to pull the wood in from the outside, populate the upper wood stockpile that feeds our central fortress. Well, keep in mind, having them eat raw plump helmets isn't really what you want. That's that's actually not the best way to go about it. What you really want is to have them eating roasts made out of something. Potentially nothing but plump helmets. So now we've got a kitchen worker, right? They've rendered our fat down, at least in theory. Let's see if our kitchen worker is actually doing anything or if they've gone on break. And this is another place where DF Hack would be awesome because I could search this list and find the kitchen worker directly. They're storing an item in a stockpile. Well, that's food or something, and that's perfect. I like them doing that anyway. But we need to start producing lavish meals. Lavish meals consume four ingredients and are called roasts. Fine meals consume three and are called stews. Easy meals consume two and are called biscuits. You can make a biscuit out of just about anything. You can, however, make your ingredients out of the same thing, so it's possible to have, as someone notes in my channel, roast of plump helmet with plump helmet sauce and plump helmet seeds and plump helmet, I don't know, garnish. But you'll also eat, burn through the plump helmets pretty quick that way, and they don't get seeds back if you cook them, so generally speaking, I don't cook plump helmets. And our record keeper has finally started to come through on the accuracy of our counts. You we have 162 drink. That's woefully inadequate. We have 294 plants, which is enough to feed our dwarves for a substantial amount of time, and also probably in a substantial quantity of booze to be made. And we have enough meat to allow our dwarves to eat just meat for uh, probably four seasons at this point. Just ballpark, and probably twice that. But what we really want to do is we want to take those items and, via the cooking menu, convert them into roasts. So it'll take this llama meat, cook it with some pig meat and llama brain, and we'll make roasts out of it. And roasts having multiple ingredients makes it more likely that you'll have a dwarf who hits something he likes. He'll get a better happy thought from that, plus he gets quality for the meal, so that's even better, and that makes them happy. Let's take a look at our kitchen worker and see what they're up to. Still moving stuff around and not doing any cooking. 
Yep, still moving stuff around. If you give them all the cooking labor, or all the hauling, or just some of the hauling. Oh, just wood hauling, which we don't want them doing. So, yeah, no wood hauling for you. And let's check in on our person who was doing the strange mood. That's this guy, and his highest craft skill is armoring. So we're going to come out of this with a legendary armor. How about that, boys and girls? Well, let's go back downstairs and get those gems cut. And we'll jump to the bottom of the list and see what we've got down here. I don't want to cut stone or clay. Let's see what kind of nice gems we've got here. How about amethysts? Amethysts. Let's put that on repeat. See how many of them we can get. If we get enough, then he'll use those. If you want to maximize the value of your artifact and you don't have the item in question, you should make sure that you're making an item of the most value. So some of these gems are worth 2 and some are worth 10, and if you want to maximize your artifact value, you've got to make sure that you use the right ingredients. I don't have any idea how much amethysts are work I'm worth, I just you know, fair to use them. Yeah, I think Toady said he fixed some of the crash issues with long histories in big worlds. But typically I won't run my history that long. But you can run your history a very short amount of time and Hopefully no one has invaded your dwarf for your your world in the first year, basically, and then you can start. And our armorer is underway, so barring some bizarre catastrophe, he's going to produce some sort of armor artifact and then become a super powerful mega armorer who will walk across to the other workshop over here and start cranking out the iron items for us at super high quality. Uh, now that we've got through our lie, we should be able to go back to... Hey, look, we've got Cassiterite Tetrahedrite. That's bronze. We should be able to go back to smelting all of our our iron down. We want to make sure we get that all smelted out. We want to smelt every piece of it we can get our hands on, because we need a lot of it to get where we're going. Between the iron we're going to make for a stopgap and the steel we will eventually make, we will go through an enormous amount of iron. And I don't think we probably have anybody else doing the metalworking industry in general, do we? This guy's really the only skilled doctor we have, so we want to leave him doing just like what he is. And let's see, who has something they could be doing? You guys will do my miscellaneous metalwork tasks for me and like it. Because nobody else is going to do it any better than you would anyway. And I want to make a few items. So other objects, iron, and let's see, I can't make what I'm wanting here. Standard furniture. Blocks. Yes, there they are, right there. Iron blocks. An iron chain. An iron bucket. And let's see what else we got here. Anything else I want there? And we'll make mechanisms out of iron as well, because that's pretty much the best we've got. Now keep in mind those are made with things that made with skills other than armoring so we don't really have or, or weapon crafting for that matter so we don't really have anybody 
in the fortress skilled at doing them, any dwarf will do them at least as well as any other. It's probably marble, and it's probably way deep in the bowels of the earth. If we've got flux down there, that's great, but right now I need to stop gap, and mining all the way down there is not as important as uh, getting some military equipment done. This guy going into an armoring mood is, like, pricelessly valuable, because we're going to turn around, and he's just going to rip through iron, cranking out our armor in record time at high quality. And he created an iron shield, so, you know, double awesome, right? And he'll go right to work, assuming he doesn't have to eat or drink. He'll go right to work making... Oh, and he doesn't have any coal. We're still out of coal? Really, guys? Come on. Oh, we haven't finished the ash jobs yet. Okay, we're still back, a bit backlogged yet. Still a bit backlogged. Have we started making the lie yet? We'll just burn all the ash up making lie because I don't care about anything else. And we've used up our cloth, so we're through all of our cloth stocks. That means we need to get some more thread made, and that means going up to our farmer's workshop and having them process plants on repeat. We'll do that at both workshops to get that started. We have haulers that will tend to that at some point. Some more dwarfs here. There we go. Here comes some more laborers. That probably means you were running at the unit cap. There's a definite reason why the unit cap is in place. Hitting the 3 gig limit is a real problem. Our frame rate is really taking a beating. See if it recovers. It may just be because they're trying to all flood through the entrance and it's having to do a big long pathfind for everybody. Looks like it's coming back slowly as they start to migrate into the fortress proper. Unfortunately, the twisty entrances are really great for defense, not so good for the pathfinding if you have to path in and out of them. So, another reason why we're going to eventually dig out a underground quarry, if you will, for our uh, tree farm is that I don't want people passing out here for the frame rate hit that I'm going to get. And our first roads are going in. Oh, 
Okay, let's sort our migrants. military squad created, don't I? Now, keep in mind, I'm not moving these guys to hunters for food purposes. Now, this is really strictly just a training thing. The food is a nice bonus, but this is not really why I'm I'm after them. Um, this is purely to get their skills up as as march dwarves as best as I can right now because I don't want to set up targets and burn through my bolts just yet. So our hunters will go around. They'll shoot at real targets. They'll gain more skill for hitting real targets than they will for hitting fake ones. So this will hopefully get them to, uh, well, what early game stuff gets you stuck? Ask the questions. I'll answer them. I'll even show you if I have an example in my fortress. And see, already our engraver's got some skill built up from doing the engraving, so that's good. Uh, we've got some stone crafters, our, our stone workers who are not always doing blocks or sometimes doing stone work. That's good. That means we're getting our nest boxes built. We should have nest boxes now. We'll build them all. Now at this point, I want to make sure that I don't have any any stockpiles that are taking eggs. I want no eggs consumed by my stockpiles just yet. So I need to double check to make sure every food taking stockpile 
is not set to take eggs. I don't want any chance that something comes and picks up my turkey eggs while we're getting these nest boxes installed. I think that that should take care of the problem for now. The turkeys, for their part, will immediately begin to migrate to these nest boxes and take them for nesting, and by querying them with T to see items that are inside them, I can forbid the turkey eggs to make sure that they're not attempted to harvest. What will happen then is because I've got a male turkey around here somewhere, we're going to get a pile of turkey eggs out of this. And our goal then is to have this first clutch from all of these turkeys hatch. So I want this many young turkeys to start. And then once that's done, we can work on building up a, a population for farming them, basically. And we'll monitor their population and cull them when we get too many. Okay, so now we've got something on the order of a thousand eggs, or a, a hundred eggs? Yeah, a hundred eggs. Ten per, ten per clutch minimum. So you're looking at ten clutches here, basically. So we'll stick a door on the, we'll stick a door on this room, lock it up, and let the turkeys hatch. And presto. Uh, we'll have enough chicks to flood our fortress. We'll stick the chicks in a cage, wait for them to grow up. Once they've grown up, we'll cull most of the males, some of the females, and we'll set up egg production, basically. We'll harvest some eggs and not harvest others. And then we'll be able to farm them for food both from the eggs as well as from the butchering and leather bone so it's gonna be a big supply of our bone bolts and on that note it's I'm sorry to say that certain animals are no longer destined to remain within our fortress uh, let's see here. We've all adopted somebody, so you're good. You're a horse, you're dead. You're a reindeer calf, you're dead. You're a drake, you're dead. And let's see, that should pretty well take care of us. All those extra types of animals, I'm not planning to maintain them. They are simply food on the hoof. And we will butcher and store all of their products in a snap.
Okay, let's get our brewers working again. Starting to get a little low on the booze. Hey, I treated them ethically. They were humanely kept right up until they were slaughtered for food. They were as humanely slaughtered as dwarves can do it. It was a really big hammer. There may have been drinking first. It's possible the animals were involved. And that'll get our animals cleaned up. That's good. He's still cutting amethysts. Wow. Yep, that's a garbage chute. It goes down one floor and stops. You only need the diagonal to keep the miasma down. It doesn't have to drop into something else. If you want to make sure that your refuse is not reanimated, you can dump it into magma, you can dump it under a drawbridge and crush it out of existence, or you can put a refuse, a tile of refuse stockpile there, have it take only for, from links, and it'll just disintegrate stuff quicker. In fact, we can do that. So now they'll dump it on that refuse stockpile and it'll just get burned up over time. And he finally got through all the amethysts. And our dwarves are living it up. Let's see. Booze is going back up. Meat supplies are higher than they were. Doing good, doing good. Let's see, in the stocks menu, we've created some prepared meals. Roasts in small quantity. Our dwarves will consume roasts rather than raw food at this point, And they will get a benefit to their happiness based on the quality of the roasts. So we're doing alright there. Now we need to start thinking about a prepared food stockpile, at least temporarily, so let's designate one of those. Prepared food will rot if it's not moved to a stockpile. We didn't have a stockpile for prepared food. We want to make sure that we get one. Okay, so let's take a look at our stockpile here. We probably don't have enough pigtail seeds to actually plant them. A baby's been born. Ugh, another birth. Yay!
possible the one barrel we have was temporarily a wall picking up seeds from the inner from the outer stockpiles. Oh yeah, well, the well is... I shouldn't say the well is up. The, the pit is dug. The well isn't finished yet. I need to check in on my uh, stocks of the items in question, because so, I ordered iron versions of them, and I don't know if they actually got done before the uh, workshop got claimed for the artifact, so I have to look at a couple things. Do I have an iron chain that I ordered? No, I do not. Do I have a bucket that I ordered? No, I do not. And I probably don't have the blocks either. Probably none of them got done before that. So let's go down and take a look at our jobs here. We should have plenty of charcoal, so now let's make some other or, uh, furniture and iron. And we'll make a chain and a bucket and some blocks and we'll also make an iron mechanism which is a trap component and that's what we need for the well No way. All right, so the di the bedding areas are starting to go in. So we've processed all of our pigtails down pretty much at this point. We've got none left. What's your question? 
oh, floors. Depending on whether you built them or not, you dig them out with a channel or you deconstruct them if you built them. That's correct. Carving staircases technically gets rid of the down staircases, technically gets rid of the floor, but your dwarves will stand on that staircase. The staircase will let water flow, so I mean it's kind of like the floor is gone, but and items can fall through a staircase, but your dwarves can still stand there, so it depends on what you really want. Still training sessions, still. I haven't seen any sparring reports. Doesn't look like we've got hunters doing the hunting yet. We don't have anything on the map because of the hunt. Let's see, quivers. Got 12 quivers. That's more than enough for what we have in mind. Ammunition, crossbows. Ammunition, plenty. Crossbows are in the weapons section. And I've clearly got plenty of crossbows. So our hunters who aren't hunting are pretty much sitting idle because there's nothing to hunt and they don't have any hauling labors to be doing. They should have, in all cases, their equipment at this point. No. I said no. And as it turns out, the only animals on the map that could be hunted are these three Kias. Everything else is uh, either undead and therefore not huntable, or hostile and in the caverns. Give me just a sec, guys. I'm going to step away for a moment.
That lovely sky blue color of my road you're referring to is the wonderful effect of having microcline to plant your road with. The blinking is because it's in the planning phase. The solid color is the ones that are finished. And I can see it over there on the right that it doesn't overlap quite the way I wanted it to. So we're going to overlap it a little. Our architect is probably off architecting it up somewhere. Let's see what he's doing. He's on break. Our record keeper, let's take a look at their settings, has done enough work to obtain highest precision and is basically standing idle in the dining room at this point, which is pretty much the way I want it. So that person will get good at socializing, helping other dwarves mediate their conflicts and so forth. Now, the one thing we don't yet have, but will engineer, is a puppy fall. We will actually set up a situation where puppies will fall into a designated area, uh, inaccessible to our dwarves, and be splattered on the ground in front of the watchful eyes of all and sundry. So we'll basically build a statue garden, and we'll pit things into the statue garden. Goblins, puppies, stray animals wild things we catch, whatever. Drop it 20 stories down into a designated area and have it explode. I think we still have some bauxite blocks. I'd have to look, but I'm pretty sure we do. So what I'm envisioning here, and I'll have to check to see if I've got the space to do it here on one of these floors. It's like this one, I can't do it unless I go left, and I think left is bad because of the yeah. So, in order to do 10 stories, I pretty much have to do it, like, just southwest or southeast of... Oh, yeah, that works. That goes all the way down to the next cavern, doesn't it? And it probably misses that one, too. That's perfect. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to do our death pit from this floor, our hospital. How perfect is that? And we'll go out this way just a little bit. And let me think about how we'll do this. I want to have a statue garden in the pit. So let's see. Where are we going to put that down here? Looks like we can tuck it in right there around the water if we do it right. Okay. So there is our destination. Bring it up. To where our pit is. And we'll dig out a hallway here and a small storage area adjacent to the pit. So we want that to be like this. And then this will be where our down staircase is for the thing people that are walking down there. And that should go all the way to the bottom too. And cap it with an up staircase. Now, what we'll do 
is we'll rig up a system where nothing goes in or nothing enters this bottom corner down here. Uh, say with a line of statues, for example, along this wall, or uh, fortifications would work, but I'm thinking stuff will get stuck in the fortifications and statues I can at least disassemble. Or we can designate the statue garden from the upper corner and make sure it doesn't quite go all the way to the bottom, and that'll keep the dwarves in the area, but not under the puppy fall. That'll work. That'll work just fine. We don't need to actually worry about where they're going to stand if we keep them from having a reason to stand in the place we don't want. So we'll dig our statue garden out to about, say, here. And that keeps them away from the immediate, immediate <laughs> impact zone. And that's 34 levels of fall from, let's see, 34 all the way up to 4. So that's 30 levels of fall. Basically nothing survives that. That's terminal velocity on demand. So that'll take care of the what do we do about the things that live problem. And our miners will get to that once they finish digging out the umpty bazillion bedrooms we're going to have here. Well, you laugh, but I mean, short of burials, there really is no other way to build up discipline in your dwarves and, and render them immune to the effects of, yeah, you're going to occasionally see your best buddy butchered by a goblin before your very eyes, but, you know, man up, get over it, dude. Come on. Because they won't bury corpses otherwise. It took them, like, up three months to get somebody who finally wised up and buried the corpse, and that was after I assigned my starting seven and they all had discipline. I probably don't have anybody else with discipline right now. So I'm looking at how that's going to potentially impact our military. Eesh. which is good for military, but... that's not going to help my civilians, who may potentially be doing my burials. Okay, so spike traps. You mean the enormous wooden spike? and the enormous wooden corkscrew, and what is the difference? Or do you mean, what's the difference between a weapon trap filled with spikes versus a upright spear trap? I mean, it's a good question, depending on which one it is, I gotta answer the right answer. Okay, so the difference is weapon traps trigger automatically. Something steps on a weapon trap, it triggers. Bang. It's like an automated, you know, attack system. Spike trap, spear traps, upright spear traps, are more like the spikes you'd see at the bottom of a trench in a real world fortification. 
So, you know, things fall on them and get speared. Now, they can be linked to a lever and fired repeatedly with the lever, but they can't actually fire themselves automatically. Unless you do something like link them to a pressure plate, and even then they're not firing automatically, they're firing on that trigger. And you can't trigger them quite the same way you can upright spe or can weapon traps. So if you're looking for something to hit your invaders with, you want to use weapon traps in any case where a weapon trap will work. And the problem you're going to run into is that weapon traps don't work on all creatures. Some creatures, like kobolds, can just run right across the weapon trap, never, never trigger it. That doesn't help them when they run into an upright spear trap being fired by a lever or a repeater or a pressure plate or whatever, because the upright spear traps don't care. They're not, they're not traps in the same way that a weapon trap is. It's basically just a, ma a machine at that point that's just spearing the air over and over again. And so when the kobold runs through that and it's firing, they get speared. But the weapon traps, kobolds can walk across weapon traps like they don't even exist. That's the difference. Trap avoid creatures can avoid weapon traps. That's the big one. That's pretty much the go-to if you're looking for how to get things into your fortress uh, in a defensive fashion is to bring it over a pit and put weapon traps on the ledge because if they dodge the weapon traps they have a tendency to fall in the pit and if the pit's deep enough the fall alone will kill them. Now you do want to watch out. There is a phenomenon that's been observed, and I don't know if it's been fixed in the current version. I'd have to look. Called the Spear of Enlightenment, or the Shaft of Enlightenment, where you dump things on a spike from a high fall, and it parries. And if it parries the spear and survives the fall... You end up with a situation where it gains an absurd level of experience and ends up being like legendary plus 76 in whatever weapon it used to parry. So you gotta make sure your dodge or whatever skill it uses to avoid the trap. Basically you can train, you can accidentally train a goblin to be incredibly lethal that way. Strip them first and you probably don't have an issue. And, frankly, 30 stories onto flat ground, you're not going to need the spikes. They're just bonus points. I expect, at the very minimum, to see parts explode. Well, see, you want them to be able to path out of the pit. You don't want to have a siege that never ends. You have to give them a way to try to get out. Now, realistically, you want them to try to get out by going right back across the weapon traps that dumped them in the pit in the first place, because surviving that fall the first time does not mean you survive it the second time. And we will dig an entrance in that fashion. And yeah, you can pour magma in, but if you pour magma in, then you've got to worry about, you know, any items you're ruining that you want to hang on to. Not everything you might melt is magma safe. We will probably try to engineer a flood trap uh, that's brutally effective against goblins without being incredibly hazardous to dwarves. We will supplement that with weapon and cage traps and a strong military. Now, that's a fairly conservative style of play, but my before I go into why that might be bad for some folks, this is primarily to teach folks, and I recognize that at any moment, any player who wants to could do something incredibly silly just for the hell of it, and effectively throw a monkey wrench into their fort. I could punch a hole in the caverns right now and not close it back up, and then wait for something to happen to my fortress and see what happened. But, in terms of getting a fortress up and stable, that's not really the kind of gameplay I'm looking for. So, I tend to play very conservatively, which leads to a fairly benign uh, fortress lifestyle, if you will. If you're looking for something a little more fun, big flaming exclamation points on the side, 
then my strong suggestion is you don't bother with enhanced mechanical traps. You try to avoid, you know, going overboard with weapon and cage traps and, you know, minimize your military. And you can have as much fun as you want with whatever invasions you're going to get. But for new players who haven't learned yet how to gauge, you know, military effectiveness, who don't know how many traps to use, I would strongly recommend just going ahead and playing conservatively your first few games until you understand how to keep a fortress up and running well, and then look at something more complicated. So our architect is running along and architecting his little brains out on all our little road segments here as they get all their parts delivered by our masons. Now once the road is up, I will know that oh, our Kias are attacking us here, apparently. Kias will swoop down and try and take things, if I recall correctly. So they'll look for unattended items that they can swipe. They'll get scared by any animals you have around. Wow, they're coming out fast and thick now, aren't they? Where are they at here? They're right over the top of us here. Horrifying all my puppies! why our hunters aren't up here hunting, though. Kias would seem to be a reasonably good target for that. Let's put those guys into the military then, goddammit.
no idea. To human size and stabbing somebody from below. Now imagine how that might be effective. Think a giant drill bit. So I think we'll station our Tell our military dwarves to station under here and see if we can't shoot down a few of these Kias. So yeah, it looks like we've finally started to get people attacking. Our steel bolts are shooting up at the Kias. Of course, you know, our archers are absolutely terrible, so they can't hit the broadside of a moon. Well, I didn't say it was any more act absolutely effective than a spike, but the answer was, how would it work? <laughs> the answer is, it would punch holes in things. Where were we digging that punched that out? Oh, we must not have gone all the way down in our... There you go. We're not going all the way to the basement on that one, are we? Nope. Not in that spot, we're not. Okay. Plan B for Puppy Falls. Staircase is in the wrong spot. Just misses the well. Touches that wall, and I don't want that. So that's not out. That's out. We can go down here, and that'll work. That will miss the caves all the way down to here. Tunnel isn't finished, is it? No, oh, we're probably about to lose a miner. There we go. So, dude just dug into a cavern and collapsed on the bottom of the ground. He's not going anywhere. We'll have to try and rescue him if we can. Let's see here. We need to seal up that staircase, because it is useful as tits on a bull now. And we need to do it quick, so let's see if we can't get somebody from the hauler core here. You two folks right here aren't doing anything else. You just became miners. Congratulations. Pick up your shovel and start digging. You guys already have trade skills, but we'll put you to work as miners for backup purposes. That gives us enough miners I think we can step quickly. I want somebody digging out both these staircases. The first staircase that I'm going to cover over because it's the quickest way down to the floor to, to find our corpse now. I didn't expect him to actually survive that fall. There's our other cavern we were missing, by the way. 
we have to remove the pipe where our puppy fall was going to be because that's now in the wrong place. And we've got to go down about, I don't know, 12 floors from where he dropped to four floors from where he dropped to get his corpse and then wall it up. And Kimberlite is the stuff you find diamonds in, yes. I believe that's correct. I'd actually like to know how they found him. Tell me they're not climbing down the shaft. I have to get a serious hate on at that point. Okay, now we need to make sure our other coffin that we built earlier is now available for our unfortunate mine worker who discovered gravity. Now I'm curious, does being exposed to things that horrify them over and over again build discipline? That's my curiosity now. Does discipline build only from training, or does it build from being exposed? Yes, and the truth is, is that if you're quick with your masonry, you can wall up an enormous section of the caverns, more than sufficient to keep your wood needs met. Early on, in most caverns, there's nothing really going on. We happen to have serpent men of some kind, which is, you know, not a good thing, because they'll blowgun your dwarves, but it's... Work around, you can work around it. If you've got a military or you dig some traps out before you actually pierce the caverns and let the serpent men come in and get weapon trapanized. The answer to how I'm going to get the guy to stay and watch the puppy splatation is I'm going to have a statue garden there where dwarves will congregate naturally and they will congregate in that area and we will pit a puppy. And puppy will go splat and 20 people will watch it. And we will repeat as needed. You mean to tell me that? Damn, Kia got underground. Really? And that one's in the sky, so that's not it. That one's in the sky, so that's not it. It's not po it's possible he wasn't underground that our engraver for some reason was on the surface and got disturbed by seeing the Kia got horrified, and at which point he'll stay up there and bounce around being all horrified to hear the Kia is also overcome by terror. That's really gotta get fixed. It's annoying as hell. That one's in the sky. I think we're probably just gonna have to station some damn archers is what we're gonna have to do. So let's just go ahead and bite the bullet and get on with it. No. Is the, now, the problem we're going to run into is these guys aren't really, you know, high-end military guys. They're raw draftees. You can't do that, Dad. 
and this will piss them off if they're stationed out here for too long. So this is really kind of a temporary workaround, hoping the Kias will come down into some sort of range where we can shoot at them. Because if they don't come down, there's nothing we're really going to be able to do about them. They can hang out there up, up in the sky all day long. We don't have anything up there to, to deal with them. I don't know if the parts will actually hurt them. We can find out. This is sort of a science experiment for me. I know the body falling on them will hurt them, but we're going to avoid that problem. We're not going to have that issue. We will totally sidestep that problem. It looks like we will use this square, if possible, for our puppy fall. It looks like that's going to hit right in the middle of the bedrooms, unfortunately which would leave us with only a few levels of puppy fall, not enough. So we'll go down and we'll say, well, what about this square? If I hit them there. This is the cave. This is the bedrooms. And it arrives, so that's great. And we'll dig that to the basement. so and I want to make sure that we get this path dug as quickly as possible so we'll remove all this excess temporarily make sure somebody is working on it making the direct connection because I want to make sure that that guy digging down has someplace to go before he starves to death the time for autumn has come Okay, so puppy fall, like a waterfall with puppies. Purpose being, as dwarves observe horrible accidents and problems, they actually become inured to their to their existence, um, realizing that they live in a terribly violent and and unsettled kind of world. It stops freaking them out at some point. So the trick is getting them to the point where they're less freaked out. It's not just collecting bodies. Hopefully that will also impact their ability to not run away from small birds and harmless deer and... I don't need them to be clockwork. I just need them to not be kitten skittish I mean Kias are not large birds guys this is not a predatory animal come to kill our dwarves it's a robin a blue jay a large raven the trick is we mitigate the unhappy thoughts with a really pretty statue garden a mist generator a beautiful dining room, an awesome dormitory and personal bedrooms, and lots of statues. Possibly also animals in cages for their natural beauty. It is related to the lack of discipline skill, so now the question is, it used to be able to cause dwarves to not care about things, basically, at some point. Yeah, maybe it's a parrot. My point is, is it's not a giant thunderbird come to carry our dwarves off and eat them. Would you be scared of that? I'm thinking no. But apparently our dwarves are. So, yeah. Not an actual waterfall. I said it's like a waterfall, but with puppies.
Anyway, as the dwarves experience this horrible, terrible puppy death syndrome thing, what they end up with is a situation where they're just numb to it all, if you will. For purposes of... for our purposes, anyway. And that's where I want them to be. Now, I don't know if that's in addition to the discipline skill, as an alternative to the discipline skill, builds discipline skill, and it just, you know, happened to be added as a skill in this episode, or in this, you know, release. I can't do it. Discipline going up through training is fantastic. That means military doesn't get affected. But the question it then becomes is, you know, how do you get other dwarves to have it? Do you stick them all in the military and make them all train? That's viable, but I don't know that I necessarily want to do that in every fort. And yes, you can make a waterfall with puppies in it, and it would, you know, amuse your dwarves to be bathed in the mist and horrify them when they watch puppies explode. Basically, you would do it with a grate. You'd pour the water through a grate and drop the puppies so they land on the grate. If you pump the water in at a lower level and drop the puppies in from above, you can keep the water going all the time and just add the puppies when you want. And yes, they'll fall. Then below the below the area where the water drops through, you can crush it with a drawbridge to get rid of it or drain it off the map. All right, the Kias and the Buzzard corpses are fighting. That's awesome. So someone was asking earlier if you could get them to a you know attract one to the other and. Apparently the buzzard corpses like Kias. They actually navigated somewhere for a moment. Yay. In fact, they navigated a little lower, so maybe they're they're almost within range. I'm curious if all these trees have broken pathfinding in some horrifying and unpleasant way. Since I don't yet have, and I'm not planning to immediately build an archery range, I want to make my hunting dwarves train if they have nothing else to do, so they'll practice hitting things with their crossbows uh, in melee, for example. And I need to make sure that they have the same sort of training orders that the other squad has. So what we'll do is we'll copy from Blunt Language Squad and we'll paste in the Cheesemaker Squad. And our hammer dwarves are almost to the point where they won't mind so much being in the military all the time. No. Formed a grudge, lost a friend slept uneasily about noise and got pissed off because he was drafted into the military. But he's mostly doing okay. No, 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 no. No! Uh, 
Unfortunately, I do not have a Linux install at home and cannot run this at work for obvious reasons. If you drop a cage with anything in it, things in a cage are in another dimension. I know that sounds silly, but that's basically the, me the mechanism. If Don't think of cages as actual containers. Think of them as portals to a pocket dimension, because that's basically how they work. If you drop a cage in magma, the animal inside is not suddenly flooded with magma. It keeps the magma out. Unless the cage burns up or melts. But you can pass items out by stripping your goblins, you know, dumping their equipment. When you put them in there, basically it's just an empty room that you're storing them in. And you access it through the cage. That's, that's how it works. Yeah, hates everything, wants to die, had an amazing sandwich in a beautiful dining room next to a pretty mist waterfall. Lost six family members yesterday and still smiling. It's not even really a box. It's really like a pocket dimension. I mean, it behaves... There are no physics applied to whatever's in the box. Heat doesn't apply. Cold doesn't apply. Nothing. Air doesn't apply. The only thing that applies is actually... Yeah, I mean, it's a TARDIS. It's a dimensional pocket it's basically a teleporter room you can do anything you want to the cage and as long as the cage isn't destroyed the animal inside is not going to be harmed now I can't promise that that's I should say I can't promise that's still the way it works in 4005 it may have been changed but that's how it worked in 34 it's basically a portal, not a not a container. All right, what else do we need here? We need a weapons stockpile. We don't have one of those yet, do we? We're storing weapons here temporarily. That'll work. Let's see what's left in our catch-all stockpile. It needs to be moved. It looks like furniture for the most part. Lie barrel. Block bar. Empty cage, bin, bin, furniture, 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 lots of furniture, it looks like. A couple of food items that haven't been stored away yet. Okay, let's go see. Did we ever make our furniture stockpile? I don't think we ever did. And we'll just basically make this a furniture dump, so all of our excess furniture that's not in another stockpile somewhere will come here to be stored to get it out of the way. Okay, so weapon traps, you ask how weapon traps can be triggered by anything other than an enemy, and the answer is unconsciousness will trigger a weapon trap. In fact, uh, the weapon trap will literally attack as though it was a person, and assuming it hasn't changed from the prior version, It'll just attack with all of its blades on whatever is sleeping on it. In addition to unconsciousness, helplessness, as in being bound in webs, will cause weapon traps to trigger. So you have to watch if you're fighting a forgotten beast that spits webs. You have to make sure that you're not engaging it in the middle of your traps because they'll trap dwarves. If your cage traps catch your dwarves, you have to make sure to release them or they will starve to death.
And the undead buzzards are getting the shit kicked out of them by whatever the hell that... Is that a human? Yeah, it's a human. They're totally getting the business. Cut down about half of them so far, it looks like. Oh, that's the horse! <laughs> the buzzard is fighting the horse. It's going to kill the horse by grabbing it by the head. Over and over and over. All the other buzzards got killed. This one is too tall. It's too high for the for the melee troops to hit, so they they walked away and left the horse getting pounded. Okay, let's see. Months ago, bad things happened. Looks like this bridal dungeon is really going rampant on stuff. Of course, that doesn't. None of this tells me anything. That's the real problem. I have no idea what the bridal dungeon is. I have no way to know what the bridal dungeon is, unless I copy the world off and go into Legends mode and review. So the Fly of Recreation attacked one of our spots and later conquered by a pr uh, whatever this bridal dungeon is. I don't see an army of mentioned anywhere here. Ah, oh, there it is up at the top. An army of the bridal dungeon. So that's some sort of civilization, presumably goblins in this case. These are mayor appointments for all the different subsites, I assume, of our civilization. Let's see, we'll take every unit of leather you can conjure. Decide what I want to buy when it arrives. And we want all of the cave spider silk you can bring. Take every log you can get your hands on, because I don't want to cut trees yet and piss off the elves just now. So this is a temporary state of affairs. If the elves bring us wood, we won't need that wood either. Let's see, I want every metal bar that has ever been minted anywhere in the history of the world. Yeah, but the places it's sieging are ours, not somebody else's, I'm pretty sure. We'll bolster our seed supply a little bit, at least this time out. I'll take all the bolts they can possibly sell me. And I will order some sheep. 
all the U's you can send. All the turkey hens you can send. And we'll take dogs, as many as you can give us. Cats, as many as you can give us. Mules, as many as you can give us. Donkeys, horses, cows, these are all just going to get mauled. I'm going to butcher them all. Pigs. So this is just ordering meat, basically, and bones to be the meat, bones, and leather to be de delivered. And they should bring a wagon next year, which would mean that we can... There's no point in bringing cavies, they're too small to produce anything. See, and I'm hoping Toady and Plot gets a way to put garden vegetables all these garden vegetables, leaves and peppers and eggplants and tomatoes and whatever. It'd be nice if uh, he moved into a building that your dwarves can build like a farm to, to reproduce those. This is an order from for the next caravan. When they come, I want them to bring me certain things. Uh, in particular, I want them to bring me things that I can't easily get, or which I need in quantity. So, sand is great, because that saves me the collection and brings me bags in addition to the sand. Um, I can use the sand for my ceramics industry if we get one up and running. Raw green glass, right now I don't have a ceramics industry, so this gives me a cut. This gives me a raw gem on site, no matter what. Uh... For the miscellaneous stuff here, most of these things we don't really want, it's just excess. It doesn't hurt to have a little extra yarn delivered. We don't really have a cloth industry just yet, so it doesn't hurt to have some yarn delivered that we can weave into cloth if we need to. And let's see... Everything else I'm pretty sure we can either produce or... It's not something I need from them. So that's good. Now that horse will eventually die, but not today. Not right now. And of course, they're going to charge me basically double for everything I asked for. 